My name is Annalena Hope, and I do work on food, food justice and food politics more broadly um, on a local, national, and a, and a global level, really. And for the sake of this presentation, I'll be focusing on Los Angeles and the issues around access or lack thereof to healthy food for certain populations. So residents of West Los Angeles, which is the home of UCLA, where we find ourselves at this very moment, and other affluent neighborhoods throughout the United States enjoy weekly farmers markets with fresh produce, convenient grocery stores with healthy food and organic options. And meanwhile, South Los Angeles and other underserved communities across the country has a plethora of fast food restaurants, liquor stores, convenience markets, and a few subpar grocery stores. So what I'm illuminating here is a disparity both within and between the built environments in Los Angeles, particularly the food environments. And because the term healthy is so subjective and it can mean something different to every person, I'm defining it for the sake of this presentation, healthy foods as unprocessed foods, foods that are organic or without pesticides, and foods that are hormone and chemical free. So discourse around food is often situated in the context of price and choice. You get what you pay for. If you're willing to pay a little bit more, you'll have access to better food. If you value your health and simply educate yourself, you'll simply make better nutritional decisions, right? But discussions such as these neglect to account for socioeconomic disparities and also the fact that certain people just can't afford to buy healthy food. Um, these discourses also overlook the matters of access and availability, which often prevent entire neighborhoods from enjoying healthy food options. And while the element of choice is undeniably significant, it's crucial to also address the structural factors that are in place which prevent certain groups from obtaining optimal health. As Marion Nessel argues, it's necessary to refocus attention on the environmental, that is the social, commercial, and institutional influences on food choice rather than on the personal. So the environmental, and particularly the food environment, is coming an increasingly important health, part of conversations about health and wellness. In South LA, the built environment, as you can see here from this slide, renders Organic and other healthy food, not only unaffordable, but virtually inaccessible to many families and individuals. Considering the distance they must travel to get to it, incurring the additional cost of transportation and travel time, and also assuming that they have a means to get it back home. Much of South LA is considered to be a food desert, um, or an area in which access to affordable and nutritious food is limited. So this particular image is the food desert around my school, USC. Um, Food desert status is not only determined by the types of food that are available, but an imbalance in the types of food that are available. So if there's a ratio of more fringe food outlets, such as fast food, gas stations, liquor stores, if you have more of those than grocery stores, it's likely that you might be living in a food desert. The factors that contribute to food deserts are particular to the region in question. Um, in the case of South LA, the lack of healthy food access is largely the result of deliberate abandonment for economic purposes. As put best by George Kaplan from the University of Michigan, food deserts are defined as areas with no or distant grocery stores. But the word dessert is also a verb, to leave someone without help or in a difficult situation and not come back. In urban South LA, there were several moments in which the community was abandoned and neglected, the most obvious perhaps being the LA riots. So in 1965, the civil unrest influenced grocery store chains to flee the inner city, many of whom never returned. And when the city exploded in flames again in 1992, there was another mass exodus of retailers and food suppliers, and South LA is still reeling from this desertion. The grocery outlets that did come back now sell products whose quality pales in comparison to other more wealthy parts of the city. So the fruits and vegetables that are sold at inner city venues are often on the verge of spoiling, Rarely are they organic, right? So why is this important? Why can't South LA residents simply leave South LA to do their grocery shopping? Well, in 2006, a report which examined the impact of food deserts on public health in Chicago found that African Americans generally have less ability to compensate for low geographic access to grocery stores. So what this means is due to socioeconomic <coughs> discrepancies, which can be measured either by income level, education, occupation, African American residents are more likely than whites to be reliant on public transportation and are thus less likely to leave their communities to purchase healthy food. 
LA's transportation system, though it's improving, is not yet comprehensive enough to allow access for South LA residents to the grocery stores on the periphery of the neighborhood. I live in South LA myself and often have to travel to Culver City or even as far as West LA to have access to healthy food. The burden becomes even more when we're talking about the multiple single parent female headed households of color in South Los Angeles, um, many of whom are parented by a mother who is either employed fully or partially and thus has limited time and energy to complete shopping for her household. And as we know, the shopping for the household, the cooking for the household, has traditionally been pegged as women's work, even in co-parented households. Female-headed households consistently report lower incomes than male-headed households, and women of color are three to four times more likely to live at or below the poverty line. So understandably, many South LA residents choose to shop locally, and they often have to sacrifice their health for the sake of ease, patronizing fringe food outlets or subpar grocery stores instead of you know, either growing their own food or going outside of their area. So, as we can assume, the implications of consuming a, to a toxic diet are numerous and deadly. And in 2006, a Blue Ribbon Commission on LA's Grocery Industry and Community Health found that, I'm sorry, 2008, found that families and kids in underserved communities suffer from disproportionately high rates of diet-related health problems. Now, diet-related health problems can manifest as illnesses from hypertension, high cholesterol, diabetes, depression, and obesity, to name but a few. The obesity rates among teens in South LA are up to eight times higher than West LA teens, which indicates a very real connection between diet and health, and a very severe divergence between the two neighborhoods. Economically, the individual, state, and federal costs of treating diet-related health problems are in the billions of dollars, suggesting that eating cheap ironically comes at a very heavy cost. So instead of addressing the causes of our poor health, doctors and drug companies prescribe medications with side effects which are arguably worse than the conditions being treated. Uh, prescription medicines can cause anything from strokes to paralysis, or in extreme cases, even death. So what is to be done? Or rather, what is being done? The individuals and residents in the residents and organizations, excuse me, in South LA have been working for decades to restore food justice to South LA, to reshape and recreate South LA in the name of the health for its residents so that folks don't have to leave the area to be well. Um, there are many different ways that folks are responding. They're planting gardens, they're advocating for new farmers markets, more healthy retailers, and one particularly inspirational woman has devoted much of her adult life to the transformation and survival of black Los Angeles, mind, body, and soul. And she provides an important model for radical health reform and lifestyle transformations. Jewel Thais Williams is an amazing 71-year young activist and entrepreneur who's perhaps, perhaps best well known for her LGBT-friendly nightclub, The Catch One. And in her enormous pink building in the heart of South LA, Jewel also provides donation-based alternative health care and she also served delicious vegan soul food until last December when she sadly had to close her doors. Um, and this has been a fate that has happened to a lot of vegan food restaurants in South LA within the last year. Um, her space also serves as a regular meeting place for political organizing and community town hall style gatherings. Jewel is more than just one individual saving lives. I think that's important to point out. Her holistic approach to health inspires a collective community to be responsible for each other's survival. And I'd like to just show a brief video clip that honors Jewel's legacy. This is courtesy of the Gay and Lesbian Center in Los Angeles.
met Joel was at the National Black Gay and Lesbian Leadership Forum. The room was packed with all these very famous and important African American politicos and celebrities. And in walks this woman. And literally, the room parted. All these people started reaching out to her. And it wasn't like she was the Pope or the Queen or anything. They had on their faces these expressions of joy and gratitude and love. What I realized later is that she had helped so many people. Here's was uh, created to fulfill the need. The Kets was important because at the time that it reopened, mid-1970s, there was still an abundance of, of racism. And the Kets offered a place where any and everybody could come. Everybody is welcome. This club would become a uh, safe haven for a lot of folks. Even Madonna stopped by every now and then. Because his sexuality, I feel it's, it's for gays, lesbians, bodies, tribes, and otherwise. At age 56, when most people were thinking about counting the days until they could retire, and you actually could have coasted the rest of the world, Jewel decides to go back to graduate school and earns a master's degree in traditional Chinese medicine. One of the key important things about Jewel starting this clinic is how she's being of service not only to the LGBT community, but to the larger community. She really cares as the person she is about low-income people, Latinos, African Americans, whoever needs help, they can come here and she will be of service. In order to be in the community that I wanted to serve, uh, affordable, and affordable to me meant nonprofit. I would like to, to show young folks by the life that I did, by example, that uh, life isn't over at 25, 35, 45, 55, 65, and over. And I still have a couple of other uh, careers that I want to try. We honor Jewel because she's a remarkable woman. She's a healer. She's a successful businesswoman. She's a community organizer. This community, our community, not only the gay and lesbian community, the African American community, the larger community, is much better off today because Jewel really walks the door. So I wanted to show you guys that just to see an example of one individual making as much of a difference with her own personal life and agency as possible. And one individual who is part of a larger collective community that's all responsible for each other's survival. Thank you.